thanks so much for that <laughs> right there we go recording in progress we're all good to go thank you so much for that lovely introduction May. it's so nice to be back with you all um and hello again to the people who have met before and the people i met at the conference which was just brilliant i was so lucky to be invited to that it was just fabulous so we really enjoyed that nice to see everyone so if you just bear with me one second i'm just going to get my screen sharing on and we can get started with my wee powerpoint where are we and where am I? Oh, there's a wee pop up like that and we will play right brilliant there we are so this is our topic for today and um, de-escalation techniques for mild to major incidents so we're going to have a wee look at what de-escalation is what my meaning by that and then think about different types of incidents that you may encounter over the course of your work. So a little bit about me first, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Karen. Um, this picture was taken a day that I'd actually brushed my hair, so <laughs> do excuse the face today. Um, these are a few wee things that I do. So I have um, a wee podcast as Scottish ASN teacher, I present on Teacher Hug Radio, and I've just written a book called Good Autism Practice for Teachers. So currently I am on maternity leave. I have a four month old, and I will be getting back into everything kind of properly towards the end of the year, the start of next year. But I've been really enjoying doing these wee trainings, dipping in now. And if there's any questions or anything at the end, I'll give you my contact details and please do get in touch with me. Um, I am checking emails. I am keeping on top of my social media. So do give me a wee shout and we can chat because it's nice for me to kind of keep my ear to the ground as well and see what's going on. Um, from a music point of view, I play flute and I pretend that I can play the saxophone. Um, if you've ever heard me, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> um, I played the flute all through school um, and so even though I'm not a music teacher myself, I am a primary qualified teacher with ASN experience and I do have that kind of experience of going through the music system myself. So I know how important um, music and the creative arts are to our children, are to their well-being, their overall you know, just their sense of self. It's a really fantastic thing. Um, music was an amazing resource for me in school and has been throughout my life. Um, I currently play with the Garnet Valley Community Band and they are absolutely brilliant. It's so nice to just get that little bit of bit of music in, even when you're adulting. Um, so what are we going to cover today? So I'm just going to shift. I wonder if I can shift these slightly. Sorry, I can see all your lovely faces at the side, but it also means I couldn't see a little bit of my PowerPoint. So I've just hidden you all. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, if there is anything during the presentation, um, you can put a wee note in the chat box, stick your hand up um, and me will keep a wee eye on that if I miss anything and just give me a shout. If I'm talking nonsense at any point, if you think I've missed anything, do just we'll stop and calm down and we'll go back to that. So this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to start by looking at what happens when a child's dysregulated and then we'll look at how we can preempt any problems and then we'll look at what to do when things have gone wrong. So when everything's just gone absolutely bottoms up, you know, what are we going to do at that point? And then at the end, as May says, we'll have a wee Q&A. Um, the recording will be turned off for that so you don't need to worry about any sort of data protection of anything there it'll be a no names q a so if you have a child in mind if you just bear in mind not to say their their wee name so what do all these words mean what am i going on about so de-escalation is a process by which we're bringing a situation back to normality so we're trying to get back to a state of low anxiety calm settled and the level of de-escalation required for any particular situation um, it will depend on the level of situation, it will depend on what's happened before, and you need to gauge that yourself or with the team you're working with and decide what an appropriate level of intervention will be. It does sound a bit scary, but that's why we're here, to try and give you a bit of a structure to this process, so to give you a little blueprint to follow and hopefully some strategies you can apply across different situations to give a positive outcome all round. Yeah. So incidents, um, it's such an emotive word. And actually, I don't love this word, but I've yet to find a good alternative that actually covers everything that we mean. So essentially, we're dealing with a young person who's having a hard time. 
And it's important to keep that at the heart of everything you're doing and really hold on to that. In front of you is a person that needs help. So not somebody that's trying to cause you trouble, not somebody that's trying to hurt you, not somebody that's trying to avoid their work. It's somebody who needs help and you're here to provide that help. So a mild incident is something um, that can be revolved Oh, sorry, put my false teeth back in, resolved with minimal disruption. So maybe a situation that can be brought back without moving anyone, for example, moving the rest of the class or moving the child out the room, um, something that can be brought back quite quickly. A major incident is something that's affecting more than just the original pupil. So maybe if the rest of the class need to vacate the room or some furniture needs to be moved, we need to call some more staff in to help, that kind of thing. And then everything in between, we've got a whole spectrum of middling situations. But hopefully, as I say, this training will give you a bit of structure, a bit of a blueprint that you can apply any time you see a situation escalating, get a little bit out of hand. Um, and this is, you know, obviously my background is additional support needs. I specialise in autism. And but this is appropriate for all children. You know, all of our kids have a specific set of requirements, a specific set of learning needs. And we'll go on to talk in a little bit about the optimal window of tolerance. Now, every single one of us has one of these. And this is where we feel calm and safe and happy. And you know yourself, there's some days that you don't feel calm and safe and happy. And that is the same for all of our children. So whereas I'm coming through a lens of additional support needs and we're taking that into consideration, all of this can be applied across mainstream settings, across any setting. So let's try and pop on to our next slide. There we go. And my optimal window of tolerance is right here. So this is how I like to picture it as an actual window. So you might have heard this term before. Um, it was initially used by Dan Segal in the late 1990s. Um, if you're looking for someone to do a bit of reading on, I would definitely recommend Dr. Segal. He does some amazing work. And so essentially, we all have this window. We all have a window. And the window is where we feel calm and safe. And when we're in this window, we can regulate for little blips. So something happens that's a little bit annoying, a little bit upsetting, but it's OK. We still manage to stay in our window. We don't travel too far out of it. For example, this morning you were making your breakfast and you spilled your juice. It's inconvenient, but on its own, it's probably not going to cause you a huge amount of upset. But if you had a rubbish night's sleep, had run out of your favourite cereal and missed your bus, all these little blips are turning into stairs and they're going to lead you out of your window and the orange juice might just be the last straw. So this creates, all these little bits are creating, as I say, steps out of your window. But equally, we can step back down. So step up, you know, bad night's sleep, run out of cereal, spill my juice. But then the postperson arrives with a parcel I've been looking for. Oh, back feeling a bit better, feeling a bit happier, feeling a bit calmer. So you're creating upwards and downward blips, sort of like an energy wave, goes up and down. For most of us, we stay inside the window. But children simply cannot regulate as well as we can. This can be due to something like autism, ADHD, or simply the fact that a child and their brains aren't as developed as ours. Children's brains aren't fully developed with their emotional literacy until their early 20s. So we have to give them credit for being children. You know, we have to allow them a bit of leeway just for the fact they're children and their brains aren't as developed as ours. So children need us to model that regulation and teach it explicitly. If a child can't read, we teach them how to read. If a child can't do multiplication sums, we teach them how to do multiplication sums. But if a child can't behave, we punish them? Doesn't seem right. So what we have to do is we have to explicitly teach emotional regulation, emotional literacy and appropriate behaviour. And we have to model it ourselves. So back to this window, you'll see those arrows out of it. If we leave the window, we can either go up or down and both lead to a dysregulated, anxious child. So if we go up the way, we move into hyper arousal. That's your classic big behaviours. So running, physical behaviours, perhaps self-harming, swearing, shouting. A child might engage in destructive behaviours, they might become very vocal and they might get physical with you. This child is super dysregulated, they're not feeling safe and their anxiety levels are peaking. 
Conversely, if we go down, we move into hyperarousal. So this is more closed down behaviours. A child might retreat into themselves. They might lose their uh, verbal abilities. So they might not be as competent with their speech as they were. You'll know yourself sometimes if you're really anxious, if you're really upset, you just can't express yourself properly. You can't seem to get the words out. And that's what our children are experiencing. A child in hypoarousal might also run away and hide. They might just remove themselves from the situation. So don't misunderstand this. A child who's hypoaroused is just as dysregulated as a child who is exhibiting physical behaviours. They're just presenting a bit differently. It can be harder to spot this child. They're much easier to overlook um, as they generally aren't causing a disruption. They're not causing any chaos. So they're kind of OK. They're getting on, especially if you're in a class situation. Um, the child that's causing a bit of bit of chaos is obviously going to take more of your attention than a child who's shut down, perhaps put their head on the table. But this child needs just as much input as the hyper aroused child. So how to stay in our window? Um, positive relationships, if you've heard me talk before, you'll know positive relationships and visuals are pretty much all I ran on about. So get to know your pupils, really get to know them, build their trust, acknowledge their needs, Set safe boundaries. So this isn't about letting children run riot and do whatever they want. Children need boundaries, but they need to understand those boundaries and they need to be fair boundaries. You know, I talk a lot about um, things like silent corridors. Now, silent corridors in a school just fills me with horror because for some children, for example, a child with ADHD, they might not physically be able to be quiet in that corridor for that length of time. Um, some children are using those corridors between classes as a way to self-regulate, a way to just calm themselves down. And part of that might be making some noise. So to have a silent corridor, you're giving them the stress and the pressure of a classroom. And then when they normally have their little calm down period, they're now not getting that and they're going straight into another classroom. So if you think of that about the window of tolerance, they're already edging their way out of it, having to sit in one class, pay attention, listen, do their jobs. And then normally when they come out of that class, they get a little bit of time to do their own thing, maybe, maybe singing to themselves, something as simple as that. And they can't do that. So they're not going to get those steps back down to remain in that window. They're just going to keep on going until they get out of it. So it's all about respecting the child's opinion, respecting their rights and empowering them. Then knowing your child's interests and triggers, listen to their special interests, their hobbies, and pursue those as a context for wider learning. So this is where I always think creative education has an absolute boost because children are generally there because they want to be there. And that is amazing. You can be the person that turns around this child's whole school career. I've seen it time and time again. A child who's struggling in standard curricular areas and the more structured curricular areas comes into the creative arts and they just find themselves and they find confidence and they find self-esteem that they're not getting anywhere else. And to find those things, they need to know their teacher, they need to trust their teacher. And that just takes a bit of time to get to know them and to prove to them that you are trustworthy. So when we're thinking about the more structured education side of it, I always recommend using a sort of thematic learning approach, um, which is gonna cover, so you're gonna select a theme and then use that as an overview to discreetly cover some experiences and outcomes. So a child's maybe not, directly especially in primary level this is a lot easier to do at primary obviously than secondary but they're maybe not realizing oh we're sitting down to do maths just now because you're doing it in the context of something they really enjoy so they're not getting that anxiety around a, a maths lesson so to speak they're thinking oh I'm doing this special interest this is brilliant um, and then they're sort of discreetly learning things we're just sneaking those those bits of learning in for them so incorporating regular sensory breaks, again, this is really important. That's like the, the silent corridors. You know, some children might um, need a little movement and perhaps walking quite quickly along the corridors could be a way that they're going to do that. And obviously, I'm not recommending we let everyone run along corridors because that's going to be total carnage. But some children might need to do a little skip or might need a little flap or, you know, they might just need something to incorporate their sensory needs there. So is this a really excellent way to... Um, work around those blips within your optimal window to incorporate those regular sensory breaks with regular sensory breaks, sorry, within your day. Um, things like fidget toys, having a walk, doing some exercise, all engages that sensory system in a positive way and helps regulate our energy levels. So teaching breaks, now this is a really good one. So 
a break in this situation is not a reward. So it's not contingent on behaviour. A break is when a child knows that things are getting a little bit much and they need to just step away for a minute, whether that's just putting their work to one side or whether it's getting up and going for a little walk. You know, it's taking a break from what they're concentrating on just now and what they're finding tricky. And teaching a child to know when enough is enough and know when they need to step away from something is such a huge thing that they will carry through their adult life. Um, it's not a reward, as I say, it's meeting a need and potentially avoiding the escalation to start with. So when we're talking about preempting things, we would rather give a child a five minute break and send them off with a little timer to sit in a quiet corner or to go and do something for five minutes that's not the job in front of them then push, push, push and risk having that eruption into those big behaviours, that hyper arousal. We don't want to push a child to their limit. We want to try and minimise that and keep them safe, happy, secure. And again, using visual structure, I do rabbit on about this, so I'll keep it short and sweet. So having that predictable, consistent structure to your day, um, excuse me, including using visuals, it gives that safe, calm environment. It's predictable. The child knows exactly what's going to happen. And it's also that extra level of communication. So as I said, if you have a dysregulated child who's struggling to get their words out, having a visual, it takes that stress off the verbal delivery. Now, a visual, I don't just mean, you know, we've got photos, we've got symbols. Yes, those are visuals, but also writing as visuals. So if you are struggling with a child, I've worked with a child before who when they were upset they really struggled to get um, their words out they really struggled to put their point across but they could write so we gave them a notepad and they wrote down why they were annoyed what was going on and what they needed to feel better and it was amazing because it meant instead of that child suffering on their own with me constantly going are you all right what's wrong tell me what's wrong just nipping their head not making anything any better they could just write down exactly what they needed and we could fix it and carry on with our day so essentially think of things that you do for self-care. What do you do to make yourself feel good about your day? What do you do to make yourself feel better if things are going to be a bit wrong? And then apply that to the child in front of you. Simple, isn't it? You know, why are we bothering with the rest of this? <laughs> so if things escalate, this is okay. Sometimes things will escalate and you might know the trigger and you might not, but it's okay. We're not going to get to a scenario that we're always going to dive in and we're always going to de-escalate in time. Sometimes things are going to get a bit tricky. The one thing to remember is it's never for no reason. There's always a reason. There's always a communication behind that behaviour, behind that escalation. We might not know what it is, but it's never for no reason. So unhelpful staff or unhelpful onlookers might comment, oh, this is for no reason. There's no reason that they need to be doing this. This is ridiculous. It's not. We just don't know the reason. And that's okay as well. Like sometimes you'll be in a situation and it'll escalate and you will de-escalate it. And then you'll think, what on earth made that happen? Why did that happen? And sometimes you can do a bit of detective work and get to the bottom of it. Sometimes you can't. And sometimes the child's not in a place to be able to tell you what happened. Sometimes they don't even know. If it's been a lot of little things and one thing's tipped them over the edge, they're going to feel a bit daft saying, oh, I dropped my pencil and that was my whole world turned to a broken biscuit you know but just because we don't know the reason it doesn't mean it's for no reason um and we can talk we'll talk about debriefs a little bit later on I don't want to jump and get ahead of myself but debriefs are a good way to try and work out and do that bit of detective work and see if there is a reason if there is a particular trigger and is there anything we can do about it to preempt it in future so staying calm a dysregulated adult cannot regulate a dysregulated child. So I love that phrase. It's really hard to say. It took me a long time to work out how to get my tongue around it. Um, but it's so true. If you're upset, you can't help a child that's upset. And you can't model that behaviour that you need them to be showing. So first, before anything happens, you know, the situation's escalated before you do anything. Take a couple of breaths. Just take a few breaths. Pause and recognize your feelings and validate them. If you're feeling scared, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling angry, that is okay. Just like it's okay for the child to feel those things, it's okay for you to feel those things. So that helps you respond a bit deliberately rather than impulsively. If you don't stop and take those breaths and recognize how you're feeling, you respond impulsively. 
So if a child is shouting in your face, swearing at you, you might raise your voice back. And actually, that's wor the worst thing you can do because you're just modelling to that child that raising voices is the way to fix this situation. Whereas if you just turn away, take a few breaths and say, I think I'm really angry about this situation, but this child needs my help. So I'm going to help them. OK, and it sounds crazy and it sounds like you think, oh, that's nonsense. But do just take those few deep breaths and validate your emotions first. And then ask yourself, what would you need in this situation? If you were really upset, if you were shouting in somebody's face, if you were swearing, what would you actually need out of that situation? What would make you feel better? What would help? What would ensure you felt respected in that situation? And then remind yourself you're taking the lead in a positive way. So no matter what happens, you are the adult and you're the one who can turn this situation around. You need to take the lead and show what needs to happen to make this situation better. So a child's not going to be able to, they are so dysregulated at that point, they cannot think straight. They are just raging, they are upset, everything has gone wrong for them. You need to show them how to get out of that situation and model your regulation. So a child might not be in the place to access their usual regulation strategies and they might not be able to do it by themselves. So you want to prompt, model and demonstrate the behaviour behaviours that you want to see happening. So lead by example here. For example, when you're taking a few deep breaths, why don't you say to the child, I'm going to take a couple of breaths and then I'm going to feel a bit better. And that might be all they need. They might just need a positive instruction to get out of that situation and it might just stop them, let them take that little moment and then be able to carry on. So co-regulation leads to self-regulation. This is so important. So the amount of learning that goes into self-regulation is huge. It's done by watching, copying and testing via that co-regulation. So the child in front of you literally needs you to show them what to do, show them what's a good, a good choice in this situation. So some generalised tips. Um, these are some general escalation, de-escalation tips, not an escalation tip, that would be awful. <laughs> and they can be applied to 99% of the situations you might find yourself in. So you might need to follow all of these steps, or you might only need one or two. It will depend on how dysregulated the child is, whether they're hypo or hyper aroused, you know, it'll all depend on the situation. And you have to gauge that yourself with the team you're working with. But this is a general framework that you can use and you can follow through. So despite your best efforts to preempt and de-escalate, the child's left their window of tolerance. And what are you going to do? So first, you're going to stop. You're going to really reduce your language. So a dysregulated child, they can't process verbal language at the usual rate. At best, they'll ignore you. And at worst, you're adding to those steps out of their window. So at this point, you can use visuals, but equally, the child might not be ready to access those either. If you need to deliver an instruction, keep it as short and sweet as possible. Now we'll swing back to the type of instruction you might give in a wee minute. Listen and label feelings. So just as it's important to label and validate your feelings, it's important to validate and label the child's feelings. So listen and observe what's happening. The feelings a child has are valid, even if you don't understand them. So using a word or a visual to label that feeling can help validate it and help the child know that you understand. If they can process it, something like, you seem to be feeling angry, that's okay. How can I help you feel better? With open, non-threatening body language and really show the child you're listening and you're there to support them. So if you're up in front of the child with your arms crossed, looming over them, not that I could loom over many children because I'm quite small, but if you are with that sort of closed shoulders, cross face, you know, you're just modeling anger back to that child. Whereas if you come to them, open hands, you know, open body language and say, I see that you're angry. That's all right. What can I do to help? How can I help you feel better? Sometimes that's all a child needs to just know that, yeah, I'm really angry. Actually, there's something you can do to help me. And they know that you're on their side and you're going to help them out of this. You're not just going to berate and shout at them until they either escalate things even further or possibly just walk away from you and run away you know it's given that open we're in this together let's talk this through yes if a child's shouting and swearing in your face that's not okay but this is not the time to tackle it 
We can tackle that later. We can talk about it later when we're debriefing. In this moment, we just need to get everything back to calm, especially if there's other children in the room. So we want to offer some positive choices. So this comes back to the instructions. So offering a positive choice out of the situation. For example, thinking about younger children here, if you're walking with a child who's kicking, saying stop kicking to a child who's struggling to process verbal language, they might just hear the word kicking and think you're actually encouraging them to kick. And that's obviously not what we're doing. So instead of saying stop kicking, we would say, nice walking please or good walking you know walking please something positive a short instruction telling them what you're wanting them to do and saying please because you know that shows that you're calm you're using your manners if you're walking with a child and you're going walking that's not showing that we're nice and calm walking please is a nice way to do it and you know you can be that whole swan metaphor lovely gliding graceful on the surface paddling so fast underneath that can be what you're feeling like but in that moment for that child, you are calm and you're giving a positive choice and a positive instruction. So personally, I was amazed at the difference this made when I was in tricky situations. You know, a child, there's one child in particular that I worked with about eight years ago and he did, he um, used to bite and he used to pull hair when he was feeling dysregulated. And if you said to this child, no biting, he literally could not process that word no and he just heard biting and he thought he was doing the right thing and you could see that this child he had um, additional support needs he had a diagnosis but you could see on his face that he thought he was doing the right thing he thought he was doing what he was asked and he was actually a bit heartbroken when you were like no stop biting me get off me you know he thought he was doing the right thing whereas if I had asked him to do something positive like you know a high five or walking or you know playing a little clapping game something like that he would have done he would have responded the same way he would have done what I asked because he was ready to follow an instruction but it was a positive instruction it was something good that we could do rather than more nibbling so offering a choice especially for a demand avoid demand avoidant child can just give a little bit of control back to that situation for them they are out of control they are grabbing for control and if you give them a choice between two things that don't matter to you in that moment you know do you want to read or do you want to take a walk do you want to draw or do you want to go to the quiet corner you know things that you know will help them feel better and it's giving them a choice it's giving them control back over the situation so for an older child for example going back to the swearing um i'd be ignoring the bad language in that moment so if you can pick anything out between the swearies like respond to that so if you've got a child saying this is effing ridiculous I don't want to effing be here you could say I hear that you don't want to be here where would you want to be right now and if the child says I want to go for a walk brilliant great they've made a choice out of that situation if they say I want to go home they say I understand you want to go home right now is school time what can I do to make it better for you show them that again you're helping you're willing to step up you're willing to make those accommodations to help them feel better so there's something maybe about the environment that that child's not comfortable with at that moment and they're not expressing it in the best way. So work out what they need, a break, a walk, a read, and then later we can go back and speak to them when we're debriefing about the language and how it's not appropriate to be shouting and swearing in a teacher's face. But right in that moment is not the time to tackle it. It's not going to make the situation any better. You know, it's, it's going to escalate that situation in the moment. And you can have a discussion later when the child's calm and it's going to yield much better results than a shouting match when they're upset. It is really hard, though, and I get that because your instinct is this child shouldn't be swearing. They shouldn't be doing this. They shouldn't be doing that. I need to tell them now. But actually wait until later. Wait until you can have that cold debrief with them. That's going to mean they're able to look at it in a bit more of a logical frame. And we'll talk a wee bit about that later because, again, that all reflects back to brain development. So your emotional literacy in the moment it's not connecting with a logical part of the brain that knows that swearing's not okay. You know, it's, they're so emotional. They're living in the moment. They're just doing what they need to do, fight or flight to get out of this situation. They're not connecting those logical parts of the brain. But later on, when we do debriefs, that is when you are joining the dots and you're connecting it to the logical parts. And then hopefully the next time, when the child's in that situation, they can draw on that memory, draw on those connections that they made before, 
and think actually this is not the best way to express myself what made me feel better a break I need to ask for a break and that's how we work on co-regulation co working to self-regulation so praise as soon as you can I know this sounds counterintuitive but as soon as a child's doing something you can praise give them some praise and do it properly because so many times I've heard to use the, the walking and kicking example again um you say to a child walking please and the child starts walking and the staff member goes now isn't that better than kicking me and you just think oh my goodness all your hard work to get that child walking nicely and now one you've just said kicking again and two you've been a wee bit sarcastic and that's not what we're trying to model so good walking is praise or thank you for walking something like that something nice keeping it positive and you need to stay positive and co-regulate. And I know it's difficult. And this is why debriefs are important afterwards. They're important for you and the child. Because in the moment, you need to stay positive and you need to model those good strategies that the child's familiar with. And at the end of the day, you know, some children just need you to be there and wait with them in a situation. You might not be able to offer the positive instruction. You might not be able to co-regulate with them for a while. You just need to be there until the child's ready to hear it. It's okay to just wait it out and be there. Um, depending on the child, I've said things like, I'm here or you're safe. So a phrase to try and avoid here is you are okay. I used to say this all the time. You're okay. Come on now, you're okay. But actually they're not okay. And I was intending it in to mean the same as you're safe. I wasn't meaning it like, oh, come on, buck up, you know. But it's important to label those emotions clearly. And by me saying you are okay when a child clearly isn't okay, I'm mislabeling that emotion, I'm mislabeling that feeling. So there's gonna to have to be some unlearning done in the future when they think feeling okay is when their tummy's churning and they feel like they're about to cry. That's clearly not okay. So sometimes I say, you can't just jump in and fix things. You've got to be patient and wait. And that's really hard as well. So thinking about some mild incidents, um, it's so hard to categorise them, but what might be mild for us, might look like a mild incident for us, can be huge to the child. And something that seems mild to them might seem huge to us. So it's kind of tricky, but for the purposes of this conversation, we'll look at mild incidents as being situations where no one's hurt or displaced. So perhaps a child's showing signs of dysregulation during a work job, but they haven't actively thrown away the items or left the table. So you want to stop, listen, offer those positive choices, redirect, praise and co-regulate. So if you are talking, reduce your language to a minimum, stop the activity, offer a break, a favourite resource or a simplification to the task, praise the child and offer that co-regulation. So this could be as simple as demonstrating that you're calm, taking some deep breaths and modelling that feel better strategy. So when I say here, just in that back, when I say stop the activity, I don't mean the child can get out of that activity full stop because then that child would learn that, oh, if I knock my pencil over and swear, then I'm going to get out of doing everything. You've got to kind of gauge it with the child. You know, I've had children that um, it's best to keep going, but make the activity easier. So help them with it, do it with them, give them loads of help to get it finished. I've been with some children that, you know, sometimes we just have to stop and we have to walk away from it. But we do come back to it. We Once we're feeling better, we have a little chat and we come back to that activity, whether it's the same day, whether it's the next day, whether it's a week later. We are not using a behavioural decoy to get out of a situation. But if the child's finding the activity too much, we need to make it easier. We need to help them with it. So it's not a, it's not as black and white as it seems. You know, um, child does this, child gets out of doing this activity. No. But if the child is doing that, why are they exhibiting this behaviour? Are they worried that they can't do it and they think by acting like the class clown they can get out of it and they can distract everyone? Fair enough. But also, I'm going to help them finish that activity because it's so good for their self-esteem to be able to go back and actually finish it positively. You know, have they found uh, a bit that's too difficult and they think, stuff this, if I shout at the teacher, then that will distract her and I'll not have to finish this. Well, it might in the short term, but actually we're going to come back and we're going to finish it and I'm going to help you with it. So, you know, it's all about gauging the child. And if they're not fit to go back to it that day, that's absolutely fine. Because one of the interesting things, once you 
when you're in, out your window of tolerance, it can take children up to two hours to get back to that level of calm where they don't have, you know, adrenaline, everything else flooding through their body. It can take up to two hours for them to feel better. If you're in a 45 minute lesson, you're not going to get them feeling back to normal and able to go back to that task. So it would be a case of giving them other things to do, giving them things that you know they'll be successful with, and then maybe another day coming back to that job and saying, listen, I know we, had, we found this a bit tricky last time. I'm here to help you. What do you need? And sort of working around it in that way. So then your major incidents. So again, hard to categorise because it's differently perceived by the child and the adults there. So we're going to call a major incident when someone's hurt, when a child's really dysregulated, shouting, crying, or others have to be displaced. So if you have one child who is dysregulated and you're having to move the rest of the children out of the classroom. So for example, I've had a child who threw chairs and we knew when they were dysregulated, they threw chairs. So as soon as you started seeing signs of that, we had to move the other children out of the room because nobody needs a flying chair to the head. And the child wouldn't throw chairs at people, but they would just be throwing things and it wasn't safe for the other young people to be in the room. So that for me was a major incident because other children had to be displaced. So you'll notice again, the steps are the same. Stop, listen, positive choices and redirection, praise and co-regulate. But you might spend a little bit longer in one stage than before. So picture this scene. There's a child in front of you. Um, very dysregulated, you were trying to complete a work task, which has now gone flying across the room along with the chair, and the child's upset and swearing. So you would stop and reduce your language. So the key thing here is your safety. You need to make the room safe. So try to get the child's attention by perhaps offering them a break. You could show them a visual. If the child's happy to move to a quieter spot, go with them. Try to follow the rest of your steps there. You've offered a positive choice, reduced your language, and you're taking that time to regulate with the child. In this situation, I'd probably skip labeling the emotion unless it specifically the opportunity presented itself, as it might just be an additional bit of language that the child couldn't process. If the child's unable to accept a break, it's time to clear the room of other pupils. It can be good to have a wee code word for staff if this is something that you think might happen or is happening regularly with you, so that you're not just spending five minutes explaining to the staff, right, everyone, we're going to grab everything and we're going to go because so-and-so is upset. If you have a word that you use, I mean, in the past, I worked in one classroom, everything was bird themed and the word for getting everybody out of the room was Robin. So if someone said Robin, you just, you got whatever child you were working with and you got out of the room. You didn't stop to ask what was going on. You just got yourself and your child out of the room. Um, in another class, I think we used windmill, which was a bit of a funny one because it sounds such a nice windmill and everybody would say it in such a positive cheery tone, but it was get out, <laughs> get out and give us some space. So having, again, if this is something that you think might happen or is happening, having a wee grab bag of resources at the door can help. So for example, if you need a list of your children, um, if you need any resources for just a quick activity that can be done in the corridor in another room, you know, wherever you need to be, you can take that and go and go and it's not not a huge disturbance to all the children. Um, so you would get the children and the extra staff out, but do keep someone to help you. If you're in a situation like this, that there's furniture flying, there's a child shouting, you want someone with you, one for safety and two for your safeguarding, because you do not want to be in a situation that it's a child's word against yours, especially when they are upset and they are dysregulated. You have to keep yourself safe as well, physically and from a safeguarding lens. You know, you've got to have someone there who can back up a story, who can give an honest account of what's happened, you know, because you don't want to leave yourself open to accusations. If it's just you and a child and a child is really upset, they could say, you know, they could say you put your hands on them, they could say this, they could say that. You need someone there to keep everyone safe. And again, that's about keeping the child safe as well, because if they if, if a child makes an accusation that's not true, then that sets them up with a reputation. It sets them up with, you know, a record of that happening. And that's not fair to the child because they've said something in the heat of the moment. And, you know, we need to safeguard you and we need to safeguard the child as well. So the person that's with you shouldn't be communicating with the child. If you are okay to be the one communicating with the child, it should be one person. If there's two people talking at them, that's going to be too much and it's going to make things worse. 
So this could also be a good time to let your management team know just in case they need to provide any backup if we're going to need any support in that situation. And also your spare person could be making the room safe. So if there's any resources that need to be popped away, if there's, you know, for example, the chairs, if chairs are getting knocked over, the chairs can all just get moved to the side. They can get popped outside the door, wherever needs to be for them to be safe. So then you wait. You're safe. The room is safe. You've got your positive choice ready for when that child's ready to engage. But you might just need to wait. And this bit's really hard. So the child's upset, they're angry, you want to be doing something, you want to be proactive, you want to fix it. But by waiting, being patient and calm, it's a hugely powerful tool. You're the calm, safe presence that they need. You're modeling that regulation strategy that you are calm, everything is okay. And when they're able to access it, they can. So when they're ready, you can offer that positive choice or redirect by talking about something they like, special interest, something they enjoy. This is where the positive relationships come in because you'll know what that child likes, you'll know what they like talking about. And that can be a really nice way of just pulling everything down. Now, occasionally a child might raise their hands to you. They might try and hurt you. It is rare, but it does happen and it's not fun. And nobody's expecting you. Like, I'm not saying you just stand there and take it. That is absolutely not what I'm saying at all. A good response to this is a firm stop and hold your hand up in front of you. Stop. One, it gives you a little bit of space between you and the child. And two, it gives them a firm instruction. Stop. This is not acceptable. This is the line. Stop. So follow this up with an instruction. Sit down or stand back so that the child's not left in a vacuum. If you just shout stop and they stop and they go, well, what next? They might just go back to doing what they were gonna do. But if you say stop, sit down please. And it's important to have the stop with a very firm, loud tone. We're not screaming in a child's face, but we are making it known that this needs to be listened to. And then going back into that softer tone, sit down or stand back please. It's giving them something to do. And then as soon as they've done that, you can be like, thank you for sitting down. Well done standing back. Thank you. And you can give that positive praise and you can make it that, just bring that situation back to a nicer situation. Now, sometimes a child may, at this point, it sometimes just sort of all seems to hit them what's happening and they've got themselves in a situation and they might become very upset. Now, it's okay to offer comfort here. You don't need to, keep your distance because of what they might have done you know you will maybe be quite upset at this point as well and you're you know giving off that calm persona but it's very difficult and you know we want to make sure we're taking care of you as well so a good thing to do here is to offer some sensory regulation so a weighted blanket a walk outside stretchy band on their chair how can we meet that hitting, kicking, biting need without them actually doing it to you? How can we meet that sensory need? If they're needing to push something, you can get them to do pushes on the wall. If they're needing to kick, we could go run about outside and kick a ball. You know, we can meet that need without it happening to yourself or to an adult that's in the room with you. So if a child does hurt you, it's okay to leave. It's okay to say, no, do you know what? Actually, at any point, you don't need to be hurt to leave a situation. If it's too much, that's okay, because you are a huge tool in this child feeling better. And if you're feeling like, you know, the red mist is coming down, you're angry, you're upset, you're scared, you're not going to be a good role model for that child. And it's completely okay to say, do you know what, I just need to take a minute and take yourself out of the situation. That's absolutely fine. So but if a child does hurt you, um, it's important to bear in mind it's not personal. That child did not set out to injure you. Their motivations are not known at this point. Maybe the last time they hit someone, they got out of doing a job and it's a cause and effect thing. Or perhaps they were deep in sensory overwhelm and needed that biting sensation and your arm was the closest thing. Or perhaps you're their most trusted adult and in their mind have allowed this situation to happen. You know, you're the one they trust, they respect, they love and everything's gone a bit wrong and they're possibly blaming you a little bit for that even though it's not your fault but in their mind their trusted adults allowed this upset to occur, to occur and you haven't fixed it so they're a bit frustrated with you and in that case it is it's best to swap with a colleague if a child is very fixated on you in this situation it's better to get someone else in because it's someone who is neutral someone who's not in the situation 
And you might actually be triggering the situation more than you intend to just by your presence. Again, nothing personal. When a situation like this occurs, it is really important to have that debrief and make amends when the situation is over and you're all feeling a bit better. So if I've been hurt, I always go back to the child when they're calm and act normally in a normal sense. And if they ask about an injury, I say something like, yep, you were upset, I got a little hurt, but that's okay and it's finished now. So that for me is within an ASN setting, very important to do because we're not blaming the child for hurting. There's a world of difference between that and a child who is purposefully hurting. But with these kind of situations, when we're at that level of de-escalation, when that has happened in a major incident, the child is not in control of what they're doing. They're not in control of their choices. They're not in control of their actions. Now, that doesn't mean they don't need to be responsible for their actions. So obviously, if they have an additional support need, the level of, you know awareness of what they're doing is different and you know the motivations might be different and we do need to think about that in our debrief you know what is appropriate for the child what is appropriate to say to the child what is an appropriate consequence to their actions and sometimes for some children um there's not an appropriate consequence because they've not been in full control of their faculties and what we need to do in future is to help them regulate better and teach those strategies. Now for some children there will be consequences if they were more in control, if they have understood what they were doing then there will be consequences but that's all part of your debrief, that's not anything you need to worry about in the moment of the situation. And I think the waiting it out especially can be really difficult in a major instant if you're waiting for waiting for the child to feel better, waiting for them to feel calm. It can be hard, but it's harder for the child, that dysregulated child in front of you. And they are trying their best. And I know it doesn't seem like it in the moment, but that child is trying their best and they're trying to fix the situation and they're trying to listen to you and they're trying to take your advice and your help. And it might not seem like it at the time, but they really are. They're trying. So back to our debriefs. So these occur after an incident. So after any kind of incident, it's important to make that time to debrief. So depending on the child, it can occur with or without them. Um, so for some of the children I work with, a debrief including them is maybe not super appropriate because it depends on the communication skills they have to understand what happened because what we don't want to do is to just rehash the situation and upset the child so a debrief is useful if we are able to communicate to the child how we are going to change things in future um, so I would always try and do it with the child but if the child was becoming upset then we're not just going back over the situation to upset them that's not what it's about We've got to remember how is this going to benefit us and the child in future and that's what a debrief is about it's not an excuse for a telling off it's about how we can make things better in future so a good example would be to sit with a child and say yesterday you were upset what can we do to help if you're upset again and create some strategies so you could say yesterday we tried to take some deep breaths and that didn't seem to help do you want to practice taking some deep breaths and then you'll know what i mean next time and pop those wee strategies in place. And then you can be teaching those within your lessons, within your day. And it means when the child is in that state of dysregulation, if you say to them deep breaths, they know exactly what you mean. They know exactly what we're going to do. Um, a lot of children that I've worked with, especially autistic children, like a lot of deep pressure. And that's one thing that I teach a lot. <clears throat> you know, whether it's a child giving themselves, we call them squeezies. Um, so they're giving themselves some deep pressure or whether you're stepping in with something like a weighty blanket or with your hands, only if you're trained. <laughs> Please don't go about squeezing children. Um, and you can give them specific squeezies to help engage their proprioceptive system and make them feel better. But obviously, if you just, if they are really dysregulated and you go, oh, do you want some squeezes? They're not going to have a scooby what you're talking about. So that's something that needs to be taught and needs to be incorporated in their day beforehand so that in the moment they know exactly what you mean. So a hot debrief is post-incident. So perhaps when the child goes home and the staff gather to discuss. So this is really, a, it's an emotive time and people will be opinionated here. And that's okay. It's a chance to get those emotions and feelings out in a safe space. It's a safe place to talk about this. These are the people who are in the instant with you. They understand. If you've got anything you need to get off your chest, you can do it in a non-judgmental way. 
So this isn't the time to correct language or phrasing. It's allowing staff to speak and get it off their chest, get it out of their system. So with a hot debrief, you would assure staff that yes, we will have a cold debrief at some point soon when we're all feeling calm because we're all full up of adrenaline just now. And we don't want anyone to be bottling up their feelings and going home and then thinking, I can't go into work tomorrow. This is too much. You want to get all those feelings and everything out and validated before that person goes home because we don't want, I've seen it before and I've, I, it was so upsetting knowing that this had happened to a staff member. They had gone home and suddenly thought, I can't go back into work. And they ended up being off sick. And that's not fair. It was not fair on them. We should have been servingly better in that sense to have that hot debrief and let them get it all out. So a cold debrief would occur a day or two later, maybe a week later, when you can look at the situation rationally. So this is when you do a bit of your detective work, looking for your triggers, examining what happened, what worked, what went well and what didn't go well. For example, we told the child to take deep breaths. They took a few deep breaths, they felt better. We said, sit down, please. And the child went, I am not going to sit down. So you could put that into their plan for next time. Don't ask the child to sit down. They don't like it, you know. And this is all, this is the time to tackle any language connection. So for example, if someone's saying that the child's manipulating the situation or they know exactly what they're doing, we can examine those comments and explain that that's not accurate and offer your alternative viewpoint. So my personal favourite is when I worked really hard with a child to de-escalate a situation and we ended up having a lovely conversation about their favourite TV programme. We ended up not going back to the maths job that had triggered the incident because frankly it wasn't suitable for that child and I wasn't putting us through that again. I needed to go away, change that activity, make it appropriate for that child and come back another day. But my colleague said something to me along the lines of, you let them away with everything, you're just pandering to them. And it's not true at all. I'm working with that child to meet an unmet need and co-regulating to reduce anxiety. And that's one sentence that I've said a lot <laughs> because I still get that. I still, I, people I work with think that I'm so soft and I let children away with things, but it's important to know when that child is really struggling with their emotional regulation because it's not their fault. They're not doing it on purpose. And if by talking to them about their favourite TV programme temporarily helps them feel better, then you can be sure that's what I'm going to be chatting to them about, even if I know nothing about it. <laughs> so as I said before, debriefs integrate both sides of the brain. So you've got your emotional responses and you're integrating them with logical regulation strategies, which helps the child use their whole brain and engage it in a way which forms memories and routines. So if you have that emotional response, and then you're talking about it later with your logical strategies and you're linking those together. And this is where labelling the emotion can be very useful because if in the moment you've said to the child, I think you feel angry. And then when you're debriefing, you say, when you feel angry, you're using the same words, you're using the same phrasing, and that's helping link that feeling with the strategy that you're going to teach them. And so then the next time they feel angry, they might make that link and say, well, last time this happened. And I did this and I felt better. And that's how we are maturing that brain and we are growing that brain. And we are just making those little links to help that child become emotionally resilient. So a few wee things to remember. The child in front of you is a human and they're a human that's struggling. And that's at the heart of all we're doing. It's we're helping another human being. They don't need to be dealt with or see the consequences of their actions. As I say, these emotional responses are not well thought out logical responses. It's not a child manipulating a situation. They're not sitting planning it out. They're just responding and they're just responding instinctively. And what we can do is teach them strategies so that they respond logically. The child needs help. You're working to meet those unmet needs. They might be unmet sensory needs. They might be unmet emotional needs. You don't know, um, but you're working to meet those unmet needs. And frame the behaviours as anxiety. See everything through a lens of anxiety and look at how your viewpoint changes. So when you're looking at a behaviour, think of the anxiety levels that that child's dealing with rather than thinking, oh, they're misbehaving, they're doing this, they're doing that. And see if that changes your viewpoint. And in the time after the incident, um, pay attention. I don't know why that came up in two bits. That was odd. Pay attention to how your relationship with the child has shifted. So. Once you've had those incidents, once you've had that debrief, 
just take a little look at how your relationship is with that child because I guarantee you it will be different to how it was before you know it will be a little bit more trusting a little bit more respectful there's going to be something there that wasn't there before that's a song from the little mermaid isn't it <laughs> um oh no it's not it's beauty and the beast wrong wrong terrible um but there'll be something there and it won't um it will grow as that positive relationship and it'll be deeper than it was so a couple of little things that I've found helpful I'm just gonna pop these up um oh sorry gone too far and let you read through these um, I, I hate when you get powerpoints and the person just sits and reads exactly what's in the powerpoint I'll not insult your intelligence and um, but these are things that are useful to well things that I've personally found useful um when we're thinking about de-escalation when we're planning those strategies when we're trying to preempt things um i know the third one spending one-to-one -one time with every child every week that's difficult that's all very well for me to say when i had a class of six children with five other staff um for some of you who are teaching one-on-one -on -one, this is the easiest thing in the world you're getting that anyway for some of you who are teaching a music class of 30 odd teenagers that's going to be a little bit trickier but just when you're walking around your class you've given everyone a little task you're walking around and you just oh yeah how you doing just that one little little connection with each child try and make a little connection with each child each time it doesn't need to be a sit down half hour catch up with oh what did you do at the weekend oh brilliant and what's your favorite tv program at the moment you don't need to get into all that just a little connection with each child that makes that child feel a little bit special so these are some important points. This is not physical intervention training. I have not in any of my slides condoned or suggested that you put your hands on children. Um, if you are specifically trained, placing your hands on a child should be the absolute last resort. So there are a lot of trainings available if this is something you feel you require in your role. Um, CAM training is what I've done personally. Um, I can count on one hand the amount of times in 12 years I think I've been trained 10 12 years and I can count on one hand the number of times I've actually had to place my hands on a child and the last time I had to do it it was because a child was um, becoming extremely dysregulated and ran out onto a road and it was when we were out of school and I had to go with a colleague and I had to put my hands on that child to get them off the road because it was a very dangerous situation so there are situations that that might need to be done, <clears throat> but unless you're trained, you shouldn't be placing your hands on a child for your safety as well as theirs. And even when you are trained, don't do it if you can possibly get away with it. You know, there's so many de-escalation strategies we can use that aren't putting our hands on a child, because once you put your hands on someone, that is just escalating it to a level that you can't bring it back from. That's very difficult to, you know, bring a relationship back from there. It's hard. I've done it, you know, I've had to do it and I did not enjoy it in the slightest and I spent a lot of time with that child repairing our relationship and restoring our relationship afterwards and just a quick note about trauma responses so young people we work with may have experienced some trauma for neurodivergent children um, the simplicities of daily life may be causing them trauma so a breakdown in school placement may cause trauma and being held to a neurotypical standard may cause trauma. Like I said about the silent corridors, you can tell I've got my bee in my bonnet about them. But for a, neuro, for a neurodivergent child, being held to the same standard as a neurotypical child may cause those micro traumas on a daily basis for them. So we need to be thinking about that and just taking it into account. This can cause a stress response. Again, we're back to that anxiety. A child functioning in survival mode imagine being in fight or flight mode constantly so tiring so we want to be aware of a trauma-informed approach so this includes things like having your high expectations teaching regulatory strategies teaching how the brain works and how we can integrate those emotional and logical sides and establishing a safe environment developing relationships empowering students and giving students control where appropriate and we will talk about this more. There's a training coming up all about trauma and trauma response. Um, I'm really excited about that one as well. So that'll be a really interesting one. So do keep a wee eye out for that. And then last wee slide, behavior is communication and it's complex. So by knowing a child well, you can preempt some situations, acknowledge triggers and teach that emotional literacy and regulation. 
building your positive relationships with children so before anything else work on those relationships take the time to get to know a child if you dive straight into teaching and learning without the trust and the bond you'll have minimal engagement so trust your gut and get those strong building blocks in place before tackling the academics and I think in a way this is also where creative um, professionals have have a little bit of an edge here because it's something a little bit different it's something active it's something nice for a child to do it's something expressive for a child to do so you've got an excellent starting point for a positive relationship there because you can you have something in common that you enjoy you know you have that that common talking point and positive relationships with families are just as important so at some point you might need to make a phone call home to explain an incident so before that, you want to make sure the parent knows you and trusts you. You want to have a strong relationship with that family and be sharing nice moments and show how much you enjoy working with the child. So that the first time you speak to mum or dad or caregiver is not a negative. And then just remember, you're doing a great job. You know, I see you all out there working so hard. I mean, it's all very well for me to say on mat leave, you know, but I see you all working so hard. And the fact that you're here um, accessing this training is amazing. I'm so pleased to be able to share a little bit of what I do with such amazing colleagues. And I think it's so important to get that consistency of practice between everyone that we work with, everyone that's working in schools, everyone that's working with young people. So thank you for being here and you're doing an amazing job. Um, so I have contact details up here. That QR code should take you straight to my website. Contact details are on there as well. And I'm going to leave that up for just a little second um, and then I'm going to turn off my screen share um, you can get to see the lovely face again and we can do a wee Q&A.